Good morning, and welcome to Epworth United Methodist Church in perhaps the strangest way we've ever held a worship service. <laughs> if you don't know me, I'm the Reverend Terry Kofiel. I'm the lead pastor here, along with the Reverend Bill Jones, who is our deacon and youth pastor, and we welcome you. We are here in a nearly empty sanctuary because of the COVID-19 virus. Following the protocol set by Governor Larry Hogan, our Bishop Latrell Easterling decided that we should close our churches in order to keep people safe. Some people have suggested perhaps that we're too afraid, but we're trying our best to make sure that the healthcare industry can catch up so that people who will come down with this virus will be able to receive treatment. So we're worshiping with a small group in the sanctuary, those who are working to do the service with us, Elaine Gradowski, our music director, and Mike Gillespie, who is our media guru, and Barry Edwards, who is also doing our PowerPoint. We also have a couple of ringers in here for the children's sermon. <laughs> so we welcome you, whether you're in your PJs or you're dressed or you're watching this live with everyone else at the regular worship hour at 1030 or you're checking in on YouTube. We welcome you to worship. We have no announcements this morning because everything is closed. <laughs> We're hoping to be back together on Sunday, March 29th for our regular schedule of events. We will try to reschedule the book studies and small group process as well as our film series. But until then, keep up with us on Facebook, on our website, epworthalive.com. And you can call the church office and leave messages or call me directly if you have pastoral concerns. But now, Elaine is going to help us to prepare ourselves to worship and praise God together. And now, if you would please join us in our invitation to grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, Indeed God, God did, did not send, send the son into the world, into the world to, to condemn, condemn the world, but in, in order, order that, that the world might be saved, saved through, through him. him. Now, if you please join us in our hymn of praise, Wonderful, Wonderful Words of Life. And if you have your uh, hymnal at home, it's hymn number 600. Wonderful words of life, sinnerless to 
the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so free they give him, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. any children here this morning? <laughs> you two are sisters, am I right? Yes. And you've never had an argument, right? <laughs> no, yeah. You have? <laughs> oh, but you're hugging now. Okay. Now, oh, no. Oh, so you've poked your sister, right? You poked your sister in the arm. Do you like to be poked in the arm? No, let's not pull hats off either. Do you like to pull her hat off? No. Does it bug you when she pokes you in the arm? No. No? Does it bug you if she pokes you? <laughs> what do you think is a good thing to do if somebody pokes you or pinches you on the arm? What would be a good response? Stop it. You could tell them to stop it? Stop. Okay. What else could you do? What else might you do? Get off of me. What do you think you do, girls? Megan? What do you think you would, what could you do? If, what, what if your sister smacked you on your cheek? What do you think you'd do then? You'd run to mama. That's probably not a bad thing to do if she smacks you on the cheek. It's better than smacking her back, right? <laughs> because sometimes it's hard to deal with people. Like in school, there are bullies, aren't there? Not in my class. Not in your class where you're lucky. But what do bullies tend to do? I know what you they annoy you, they make fun of you, and sometimes they hit you. Now, it's really hard when you think about people who hurt each other and what Jesus said to do. Jesus said, if somebody hits you on the cheek, what are you supposed to do? What do you think Jesus said? No, Jesus said to let him hit the other cheek. Now, I don't want you to do that in school, or I don't want you to do that with your sister. Telling your mom is probably a better thing to do in that situation. Or if you're in school and somebody's picking on somebody else, it's always good to get an adult, either a teacher or a guidance counselor or somebody who can help. Or a principal that's walking around. Or a principal that's walking around. Absolutely. Principals don't like it when kids hit each other. But Jesus wasn't saying that to kids so that they'd get beat up. But he was saying to them that it is really important not to return bad things with bad things. That's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Because he wanted us to realize that in order to be like him, we have to do things in a different way than the world has ever known before. And that's hard, because I don't want you all to get hit, OK? Remember that. But I do want you not to hit back. And I think that's part of what Jesus wants us to do, is to not fight back, but instead to choose a better way. And the better way is to be more like him. because. They did some awful things to him, didn't they? But he returned that with love, and we're called to love one another. I have a little prayer together, and then you guys can go back and work on that big stack of homework you got to take home with you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a prayer. Jesus, we thank you for teaching us a better way. Help us always to look to you, to imitate you, to be as much like you as we're able to be, because we love you and we want to serve you and praise you. And while schools are closed, we pray for the safety of all our friends, our teachers, all the faculty and staff until we can be together again. In your name, amen. amen. Okay, thanks, guys.
So our first scripture reading for this morning is from the epistle of Titus, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And while we're worshiping kind of in your living room, if you want to pull out your Bibles and follow along, that'd be great. But I think you may be able to see it on your screen, too. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show every courtesy to everyone. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
The Gospel lesson takes us back again to the Sermon on the Mount, the foundational teaching of Jesus. He had been followed by the crowds because he had been healing. He had been giving words of hope, things to which they weren't accustomed. And so while he sought to teach those first 12 that he had called to a special ministry with him, the others crowded around to hear. Now, if you remember the beginning of chapter 5 that we read in worship just a few weeks ago, and most of you know as the Beatitudes, he's talking about the blessings of God that don't seem necessarily likely. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. And he goes on to, in the Sermon on the Mount to say some things that are even less sensible to those who are listening. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ from the fifth chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Speaking to God. Of. It's a tough passage. Then we get to that last line, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we think that must let us off the hook because we're not perfect. Only God is perfect, so I don't even have to try for these things. That's not quite true. Every United Methodist pastor who is ordained has to answer questions that were formulated centuries ago by John Wesley. Are you going on to perfection? And we sort of mumble, uh, yeah. And then the second question is very much like the first. Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? Well, I was ordained by Bishop Joseph Hughes Yackel, who was one of the first bishops of the United Methodist Church, meaning he was elected in 1968 when the Methodist Church merged with the Evangelical United Brethren in Christ. He came from the EUB side of the United Methodist family, and those were not questions they were asked. And the first time he had to ask them when he was ordaining a class of people, he thought, what a ridiculous question. Are you going on to perfection? None of us will ever be perfect. Only God in Jesus Christ is perfect, he thought. But then he said later, he thought on, if the answer is no, then where the heck are you going if it's not on to perfection? To be made perfect in love is not to be made perfect or sinless or faultless before God, because as we said, only Christ is sinless and perfect and faultless before God. But to be made perfect in love is to get to a point where your motivations and all your desires are rooted in God's love for us in Jesus Christ, rooted in his cross, rooted in his life of giving and self-giving love. And so, let's look at perfection not as being sinless, but maybe if we understood it as being brought to completeness, which is really a better translation of that passage from the Greek. Or what if we even want to step for farther and said to ourselves, what if it is brought to be more like Christ, more like our intended purpose as God's people? We've been studying forgiveness during this Lenten season, and it's a tough one because it's hard to forgive. We confuse it. We said last week, forgetting means you have to, forgiving means you have to forget, but that's not true. Forgiving means giving up the right to revenge turning the other cheek. But sometimes it's hard to keep turning cheeks if you feel that all you do is get slapped down. So what is Jesus talking about here? He says if someone asks you to go one mile, go a second mile. That is a very specific reference to the Roman occupation in first century Palestine. 
someone, either a centurion or sometimes just a regular soldier marching, could grab a Jew from the street side, from his place of work, and force him to carry his equipment for a mile. That was the limit of the law. But Jesus says, if you're forced to go a mile, don't stop there, but say, I will go with you a second mile. And if someone takes your coat, give them your cloak as well. Meaning, if someone takes the bare necessities of your life, you give them the barest necessities of your life. You give them even more, because that is the way to show them who God is. It's also a way to claim power. Because what if we look at going on to perfection? What if we look at being made perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, as becoming more Christ-like in our daily living? What if we look at it as not as something we're forced to do or mandated to do or something the law requires of us, but as something that Christ himself, through the power of his Holy Spirit, gives us the power to do in his holy name? What if vulnerability that is done willingly is a sign of power? What if we are stronger in our weakness? A good lesson for this very precarious time in our life together in the world as brothers and sisters across the globe that is struggling against a pandemic? What if we claim our strength in Christ? I think we would live differently. Laws are hard to follow, aren't they? Because we tend to revolt and rebel and be stubborn about laws. We don't like speed limits. We don't like helmet laws if you ride a motorcycle. And a lot of people don't even like seatbelt laws. So they made the seat belts go beep, 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 <laughs> beep, 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 and make it so annoying that you have to, have to, have to, have to put it on. The Old Testament laws were very stringent. And we look at them now and we're a little confused. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But that was justice in those days. That was let the crime, the punishment fit the crime. So if someone lost an eye, they couldn't take your life. If someone was hurt in an accident, they couldn't demand your life. Or if you stole someone some, from someone, you didn't have to necessarily require their hand to be cut off in punishment. But Jesus is saying these laws were meant to be justice. But God's justice is deeper. God's righteousness requires more of us. And forgiveness is something that we're required to do. But what if we looked at it as something we're empowered to do instead of something that we are required to do to prove that we're Christ's people? What if instead we look at forgiving one another as a way of being more like Christ through the power of his Holy Spirit? Some of us have been reading the book Amish Grace, How, Grace trans how Forgiveness Transcended Tragedy. It goes back to the story that happened, unfortunately, close to where we live in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in the West Nickel Mines community, when a man who was grieving the death of his child decided that he was going to return the grief that he experienced with evil against other children. And so he armed himself. And he went into an Amish schoolhouse, a building without a lock on the door or any sense of security systems or even a telephone. And he murdered five children. We cannot wrap our heads around the murder of children in any circumstance, but especially it seems in the Amish community, who are a distinct people, who are a peaceful, nonviolent people, a people who choose a way of life that brings them as close to God as they can be. As I've said in previous sermons, they pray the Lord's Prayer every day. It's the only prayer that's prayed aloud in the Amish community for fear of being boastful or using flowery words if you try to compose a prayer for others to read. So what did they do? They immediately forgave the man who hurt their children. We can't imagine that. Now, what happened in the community was surprising to a lot of non-Amish, what they call the English people around them, their English neighbors, and the larger world around them, because there were people who condemned them for forgiving. I read an article from the Boston Globe, and I included it in the packet of information that we're reading, those of us who are studying the book. And the writer said, I don't want to be like this, dispassionate about the death of children. 
They were hardly dispassionate. Their hearts are broken and still aching. I met with a member of the Nickel Mines community just a few weeks ago, and as he sat and shared with me his remembrance of the event, his eyes filled with tears. And he shook his head and he said, we just will never know why. But that did not stop their forgiveness. And some people think they sat together in a group and decided whether they would forgive or not. That wasn't how it happened. It's just the way they live. They don't have Sunday school. They don't have religious education. They have no seminaries. And yet, forgiveness is natural to them as breathing because they seek Christ above all things. And in that community of meek people that we look at and some look down upon, we see the power of God at work. Tonight's film that we're not going to see, if you have Amazon Prime, you can see it as part of that benefit called Forgiving Dr. Mengele. It's a story, it's a documentary about a woman named Ava Kors who died just this past July. She and her family were taken to Auschwitz, the concentration camp, because they were Jews. She watched her mother being dragged away from her children screaming and she never saw her again. That was the last memory she had of her mother being pulled from her children and taken to the gas chambers. Ava and her sister, however, were spared because they were twins. And Dr. Mengele, a physician whose Hippocratic oath begins with do no harm, used Jews to experiment upon pregnant women and twins. They were injected with chemicals and drugs to see what would happen to them. And Ava Kaur said she stayed alive by the sheer force of will because she knew if she died that her sister would be euthanized so they could perform a double autopsy. We cannot imagine the horrors that she endured at eight years old. So what did she do? Years after the war, she decided that the burden of this was too much for her to bear. And through the strength of her faith in God, the God of our ancestors, because Ava was a Jew, she chose to forgive because it freed her. And she said the moment that she forgave Dr. Mengele, who had never asked to be forgiven, who thought he had no reason to be forgiven, who was trying to perfect an Aryan race by eliminating Jews from the planet, he didn't deserve her forgiveness, and yet she forgave him through the power of her will. And for that, she was criticized. Well, forgiveness does that, doesn't it? It's a powerful thing. And if you don't understand it, you might choose to condemn it. There were people who even faulted Pope John Paul II when he forgave the man who shot him. Someone said to me, how could he do that? The man tried to kill him. My answer was, well, you know, he kind of is the Pope. He and Jesus are sort of like this. But forgiveness, if you wait for it to be a natural inclination, you're going to wait a long time. Because forgiveness does not come easily. Nor does giving your cloak when someone has stolen your coat or voluntarily going the second mile when you've been forced to go one, or turning the other cheek when you've just been slapped. It's not easy, but it's possible. The epistle lesson that Bill read from the letter of Titus is one that we usually read Christmas Eve or Christmas morning. Let's look at it again. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led us slaves astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This spirit he poured on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Are you going on to perfection? Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? 
Bill and I had to answer those questions at our ordination. But I think they're questions that God asks of each follower of Jesus Christ. Are you going on to perfection? Are you going to be made perfect in love in this life? Are you going to let my spirit work through you to fill you and use you and let you forgive the worst of offenses in the name of the one who forgave all our sins? I agree with Bishop Yackel. If we're not going on to perfection, where the heck are we going? To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a hymn now that may not be as familiar to some of you, and we picked it quite a while ago, before we were faced with such a crisis in the health of the planet. So we invite you to join in singing, or at least in praying, healer of our every ill. Beloved, would you join me in the prayer of confession and assurance of pardon? Turn the other cheek, Lord. Love our enemies. You can't mean that, can you? Aren't we supposed to stand up for ourselves? If we don't, they will walk all over us. And it's getting harder to tell us from them. Within our own nation, and denomination, we are told to choose sides. We have embraced the world's definition of enemy and expanded it to include almost everyone with whom we disagree. We fear those who are different. We label and judge. 
but your way seems too hard, too demanding. It leads to a cross, and we're running out of cheeks. God, have mercy on us. Forgive, Forgive us, us, Lord, when our, our values, values reflect the kingdom of this world instead of your, your kingdom of justice and shalom. Break, Break our hearts with love for others, for we yearn to live as your children. Rid us of malice, envy, prejudice, and bitterness in the name of your Son, the Prince, Prince of Peace. Take this moment in silent prayers of confession. As he hung on the cross, looking upon those who put him there, our Lord prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Those words echo through the ages to include his disciples in every time and place, redeeming us and urging us to extend grace to others. Receive the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. And share the peace of Christ, elbows, fist bumps, peace signs with those around you. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Amen. It's hard to share our joys and concerns when you're not here to share them with us. <laughs> we do give thanks to God for those who are willing to come out today to make this worship experience possible for us. And we are grateful to have the technology to be able to share. So many smaller churches don't have the ability to broadcast their service in any way. And so we give thanks to God for the rich resources that Epworth has in terms of not just equipment, but in people willing to give their time and their talents to share. We thank God for this community of faith. We thank God for all the resources of this nation and the world that are now being put to proper use to bring hope and healing to others. I have yet to find anything that God and Jesus Christ is unable to redeem. And in the midst of this pandemic, I think some of that redemption is going to come from people forgetting their petty differences and working together to bring hope and healing to the world. That's what we're called to do in the name of Jesus Christ. So for all the blessings that we've experienced, we give thanks and praise to God. We do have some concerns to share. Dottie Johansson has been admitted to GBMC. We ask for prayers for her. She's had a high fever and is receiving antibiotics by IV. So we ask you to pray for her and for Gary, and for all who are hospitalized and those in nursing homes, especially this day. Because we have so many fears around this virus and the possible devastation that it's going to cause in our community, it makes it very difficult for pastors to visit because we have to be screened and in some cases are not allowed to visit at all. But we do ask you to keep others that we don't know about in our prayers. So please contact the office if you have special needs or concerns for others. We also pray for Pushpa and Topeka because of Prem's death. Some of you have received the word, I think most of you have by now because we did send that word out. And his life is being remembered in India and when they are able to return, we will have some sort of memorial service, I'm sure, here for him as well. But please hold that family in your prayers because Pushpa just lost her mom and now her beloved husband. Are there any other concerns that you know about that we should share? Not that I can think of at the moment. Anyone else who's here this morning? We do have a few people here. Then let's pray together. Holy God, we are struggling so much right now. We are so tempted to give way to fear, to hoard our belongings, and to close ourselves off from the world. But that's not what you call us to do. You call us to a life of self-giving love. And so we will do our best, even in the face of fear, to live faithfully and purposefully as your disciples. We give you thanks for all that we have been blessed with, even on these difficult days. 
and we pray for those who are struggling so hard to bring hope and healing to the world. We pray for the leaders of the world's governments that they might put aside their differences and do what is best for the people that you have created. We pray for the healthcare workers, those who are on the front lines of this, those who have been exposed to this devastating virus and who wait to see what the consequences will be, but continue to get up every day and go to a hospital and put on protective gear and bring hope and healing to those in their care. We pray for those who are suffering with illness, whether it is from the COVID-19 virus or from all other illness. We pray that you, the God of healing, might touch them and might work through us to offer words of comfort and peace to those who are in need. We pray for those who are grieving now because death comes at the end of life here, but it is the beginning of life eternal. But in days of terror and fear, we need your presence and your peace to comfort our hearts, that we might comfort the hearts of those who have lost so much. For all the gifts that you have given this congregation, for the gifts that were shared online, for the gifts that will be shared when we return, we thank you for the faithful discipleship which keeps this ministry working in your name in the world. And we yield ourselves now always and everywhere to you. You've called us to be perfect, and we cannot be perfect, but we can be perfect in our love for you. And we can let that strengthen us and send us into the world as renewed and restored people ready to do your will. So we pray, Lord, that you would make us more like your son, who restored the image of true humanity when he came, when he gave himself, and when he was raised up for our sake. And through him and in his power, we pray as he has taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of sending is another prayer. The words are very simple. They are in Latin, Dona nobis pacem, give us peace. There are three parts and we have three singers, so we're gonna do our best. But we invite you to sing with us as we pray that God would grant us peace.
morning began with a very familiar passage from John's Gospel, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him may not perish, but have eternal life. That's from the King James Version. We all know it because we learned it young. We need to learn the second part of that, verse 17 as well. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The world. Those we call enemies. Those we call friends. Because God causes the rain to fall on the just as well as the unjust. God created the whole world and everyone that fills it bears the image of this creative, beautiful, wonderful, powerful God. So go into the world to forgive because you've been forgiven. To love because you've been loved. To serve because we have been served so very beautifully by the God of all grace. So go into the world to proclaim that through all that you say and all that you do. And the blessings of God Almighty, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, will be with you now and always. Amen.